It's a delight to welcome Corporal Nick Bull to read our Bible reading today. Nick was married here in church a few months ago, um, and it's good that he is able to be part of our worship today. And then we have our Archdeacon, the Venerable Stephen Pullen, who will be preaching for us immediately after the Bible reading. Thank you. The Bible reading is taken from the book of Amos, chapter 5, beginning to verse 18. The day of the Lord, a dark day. Alas for you who desires the day of the Lord. Why do you want the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light. And if someone fled from a lion and was met by a bear, or went into the house and rested a hand against the wall, and was bitten by a snake, it is not the day of the Lord, darkness, not light, and the gloom with no brightness in it. I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters, and your righteousness like ever-flowing stream. This is the word of the Lord. Memory is essential to all our lives. Memory is the place that grief is held and in which we seek healing. But without a, a memory of the past, it is impossible to operate in the present or think about the future. Without remembering what we did yesterday, how can we plan for what we do tomorrow? Without memory, we cannot learn anything. Our memory is built of blocks that all fit together to form our consciousness, affecting our every decision. Everything we have learned from the beginning when we learned how to read, how to interact with others, how to manage conflicts, all these things, all these memories, all this learning makes us who we are. Nobel laureate and founder of behavioral economics, Daniel Kahneman, made the following distinction about how experience and memory affect our future behavior. We actually don't choose between experiences, he said, we choose between memories of experiences. And even when we think about the future, we don't think of our future normally as experiences, we think of our future as anticipated memories. Our act of remembrance then serves not only to honor the sacrifice of others, it also enables us to extract out from the past lessons which structure the future. Today the nation participates in an act of remembrance. We remember the enormous, the enormous sacrifice made by our armed forces and their families. We remember those who have lost their lives as a result of other conflicts and terrorism. Our act of remembrance is our, an expression of unity and of gratitude and of commitment to preventing the future horrors of war. The Great War began on the 28th of July 20, 1914 and lasted until the 11th of November 1918. It was a war in which more than 70 million military personnel were mobilized, in which more than 9 million combatants were killed. The act of remembrance, this act of remembrance, embraces that conflict and the many conflicts that have taken place since then, both regional and global. If memory functions in part to guide future decision-making, then it is impossible also not to have in our minds today the conflict in Israel-Palestine or indeed yesterday's report that Ukraine was hit by Russian missiles for the first time in 52 days. Now, I don't want to say anything that may be misunderstood or distract from today, but what I will say is that the horrific suffering, particularly of children, that continues to unfold tells us three things. 
First, if the purpose of memory is to extract out from the past lessons which structure the future, it is self-evident that we are not succeeding in the way the most vulnerable need us to. Second, despite our shortcomings, even perhaps because of our shortcomings, today's act of remembrance remains a vital and necessary occasion, which we hope and pray inspires people to promote peace and insofar as it is within their gift to act as peacemakers. Our act of remembrance also challenges the decision makers to think deeply before embarking on the path of violence and armed conflict. And I say that recognizing, and I speak for myself here, recognizing the reality that war may be just, even if it is tragic. The Old Testament reading, which we heard a few moments ago, was a reading from the prophet Amos. Uh, it's the set reading for the day. Uh, in many ways, it is an awkward passage, given the reality of events in Israel-Palestine, but it's what we were given to work with today. For six verses, Amos dismisses superficial behaviors and expectations. He does this speaking on behalf of God in the strongest possible terms. And remembering that the context for his words was conflicting attitudes regarding what would bring security to the nations or the people groups. Not much seems to change. National security is the issue into which Amos speaks. In that context, and having dismissed those superficial behaviors and expectations, he then concludes with these words. But let justice roll down like, river, like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And one of the applications of that point is this. Invoking God to justify war is utterly contrary to God's nature. That goes for Christians, Muslims, and Jews we're all in the same boat. Worship of the divine is to be absolutely repudiated if it is not accompanied by substantive change in our behaviors and our attitudes towards others. Amos's pointed insistence in the context of the contested question of security was that justice and righteousness is the real worship. These words have both, I think, an eternal application as they have a timely resonance today. Let me change focus for a few moments. I've reflected on the purpose of remembering the contemporary context and the words of the prophet Amos. These are big issues. Uh, in many ways, they're far away issues. Uh, so let me end by bringing it closer to home to think about us as individuals. As Christians, we have nothing to say to the world if we don't begin with ourselves. For those of us here with a Christian faith, we recognize that we are part of a very remembering faith on this Remembrance Sunday. Remembering lies at the heart of our worship. The Eucharist, Holy Communion, is a constantly performed act of remembering. Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood. Eat, drink, do this in remembrance of me. The meaning of the word remembering is, of course, to do with bringing back together those things that have been scattered or wrenched apart. <coughs> to remember is to make whole once again. In remembering the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we participate in an act of remembrance that makes us whole because Jesus has the power to do that. And in being made whole again, we can forgive and be forgiven. We encounter the peace that is beyond the grasp of human endeavor. 
and so we can be agents of peace and, and reconciliation for the people and places that are without peace. And we do that alongside all people of goodwill. We long for a better world and we long for peace. I believe that one day that will happen when Christ returns. I have that very simple faith. But we have to engage with the reality of the world in which hate and conflict still exist. So what do we do in the meantime? Well, St. Francis suggested we begin with ourselves. The refrain in one of his prayers, which I'll end with in a moment, was this. Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. As Christians, we embrace God's invitation to allow the forgiveness-bearing, life-transforming, peace-giving presence of Jesus to be at the center of each one of us personally, profoundly, and permanently. We can shout and protest at the injustices of the world, and so we should. But our voices and our actions won't mean much if we don't start with ourselves. So this morning, I, as Catherine has already done so, and will at the end, invite us to recommit ourselves to the pursuit of peace once again. To be open to the transforming presence of Jesus within us, that we may be a transforming presence in our homes, our families, our communities, our institution, our offices, uh, our political gatherings, wherever we can exert influence. So those words of St. Francis. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth, the peace that was meant to be. With God our creator, children all are we. Let us walk with each other in perfect harmony. Let peace begin with me. Let this be the moment now. With every step I take, let this be my solemn vow. To take each moment and live each moment in peace eternally. Let there be peace on earth. And let it begin with me. Amen.